Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Well, I'm really very glad to see everyone. Yeah. Do you know what today is? What uh, part? What uh, candle that we uh, have lit for? It's down here now. If you're looking over there, it's over here. We played a switch up on you. Uh, do you know what week it is? Do you remember the first week? What was the first week? Hope. Very good. How about last week? Peace. Peace. Right. And today, do you know what it is? A cheater. If you if you a cheat a sheet is literally on the front of your bulletin. That's yeah. Joy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Joy. And we're going to really celebrate with joy today. Uh, the fact of, of course, our fellowship with one another. The 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 goodness of God in that, of his provision, his protection, uh, but most of all, the joy that we have that the world cannot take away from us, the joy we have in Jesus. So, do you have something you want to just praise the Lord for? Yes, ma'am. Um, God is good. He's really taking care of Amen. Amen. Hey, I got something. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What else? How has God shown up in your life and your needs this past week? Can you think, you don't have to say it out loud, but can you think of a way that God has shown up in your life this past week? I can. God's so good. Uh, I will, I'll, will mention a couple of things this evening. The men's fellowship team for planning purposes will be meeting at 6 o'clock. Um, right after worship, uh, there is a meeting, just a short, short meeting. If you are or have somebody you're responsible for who's going to be, be participating in the children's Christmas program next Sunday morning, uh, Diane would like to meet with you and to talk about that briefly, maybe five minutes, ten minutes at the very most, uh, because I think there are some things she would like to just, she needs to find out, I think, figure out where things stand, and then also to just kind of uh, give you an idea how it might work, too. So uh, there will be a practice um, Saturday morning next week. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions about that, just ask Miss Diane. All right. Um, and just so you know, uh, Christmas Eve Eve, we are having a candlelight service, so uh, we welcome you to participate in that, and I uh, hope that if you're free and um, are in the area that you would be a part of that. So, Okay, yes, Rick? With that, Tony, I have a question. I assume we're going to have a morning service as well? Yes, yes. We are not foregoing our morning service. Uh, we will be here at 11 and Sunday school at 10 and... Um, the the uh, candlelight services at six o'clock. So yeah, good question. Yeah. All right. So if you would, would you please stand and we will welcome the Lord in prayer and remain standing for the Advent scripture reading. Um, Miss Minnie's going to lead that and then we'll move into our congregational singing. So join me in prayer, please. Just reach out to the Lord, seek his face, ask him to be glorified in our time. And ask him also for an open heart to hear and receive from him what he has for you today. So, Father God, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord. We rejoice in you, Lord. We rejoice, Lord, in who you are, Lord, as well as what you have done. What you have done for us together as, a, as, as believers, Lord, as your church, Lord. But also, Lord, what you have done for us individually, Lord, in Jesus coming, Father, that, that great miracle that you set in motion, that he would take on flesh, Father, so that in the, ultimately he would then die for us, Lord, taking on himself, Lord, the weight and the horror of our sin, so that, Lord, as he rose again, we'd have the assurance of eternal life, Lord, as we've come to you in faith 
seeking your forgiveness and relationship with you. Lord, you have set in us, Lord, your love. And we rejoice in what it is that you have done there, Lord. You have given us a new perspective in, on life, Lord. You have given us a hope the world can't take away. We have peace with you, Lord God. And the joy that we have in Jesus Christ, Lord, this eternal joy that we have, that we are forgiven, we are made new, that we are yours, we have an eternal home with you forever, and Satan can't do a thing about it, Lord. We praise you for that joy. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for the requests that have, that have been mentioned, Father. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'll move in each need. Lord, the physical needs, we've mentioned cancer, we've mentioned other kinds of things, Father, other afflictions and, and sufferings of people, Lord, who were not here, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you'll move in each need and that you'll make your presence felt and your truth, Lord, the promises of your word, Lord, would ring in the hearts and the minds of those, Lord, who are not with us today, who are suffering in some way, Lord, that that truth, Lord, would penetrate their, 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 their hurt, their anxiety, their fear, their loneliness, whatever, Father, and bring to them the joy of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you'll continue to move in each of those needs lord we rejoice in how you've answered prayer how you've answered lord the requests that we've given to you lord and then some answers to prayer we didn't even know we needed to pray and how you've moved in needs father beyond our understanding we pray lord your truth lord would be a light for us as we look to you through your word today we love you lord bless each one here in a profound and, and wonderful way we pray and i pray in jesus name Amen.
us pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you so much for everything that you've given us, Lord, for this gift of life that you have granted us, Lord, this physical life, and Lord, also the spiritual eternal life that you have granted to us as well. Lord, we just want to thank you and keep praising you uh, for as many days as we have left, and Lord, also into eternity with you. Thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I just pray that this message will bless us and glorify you and you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we, uh, we say that Christmas is a time of joy. Who here would agree with that? It is. It is. It is. You know, a lot of people don't feel joy at Christmas time for various reasons. Um, a lot of the holidays for many have, uh, they have a way in some instances to underscore for some people loneliness, um, the, the weight of some sort of tragedy uh, over the past year or, or something, there are different reasons. But for some, it's hard to feel joy. And, uh, and yet at the same time, we have constantly blasting us messages that we are to have joy and so forth. And as you, as you know well, that a lot of the media, when I say media, I mean not only the TV media and social media, just, just the flow of conversation. Every time you walk into a store, every time you just step outside, basically, you're inundated with this idea that this is a season of joy. And the, an interesting thing about that for me is the fact that I feel that in so many cases, so many instances, that those who are proclaiming joy have lost touch with the reason for that joy. It's awfully hard to just conjure up joy when you can't see a reason to feel joy. So what I was led to in preparation for this week was as we talk about joy, first of all, just simply to say this, don't miss the joy of the season. But I want to unpack that. But again, let me say, don't miss the joy of the season. There are two fundamental errors we can make in regard to joy. And the, the first and the first reason that we tend to miss the joy, of course, is the fact that we're so, we're so quick to find joy in peripheral things and forget the underlying joy of Christ. So what I mean when I say finding joy in the peripheral things, and there, it's not bad to find joy. Please don't misunderstand. I think you should find joy in the peripheral things. For me, one of the, one of the things I find joy in is uh, at, late at night is a, is, a, is, a, is a stack of chocolate chip cookies. And uh, they're an endangered species at my house when they're at my house for any length of time because if I find them, then they're not there very long. Why? Because I find joy in those cookies. I find joy in Christmas music. I find joy in the lights. I find joy in our fellowship. I find joy in these things, and those are good things, are they not? You find, might find joy in singing carols and Christmas candy and, and uh, the decorations of the season and so forth, and that's, that's fine. That's good. But if your joy is summed up in those peripheral things and there's nothing underlying them, if it's just the tradition if it's just the lights, if it's just the celebrating, if it's just the music, if it's just the food, if it's just the family gatherings and so forth, if it's just that, then you're inevitably going to come to a place where you no longer feel joy. Because none of those things are sources of lasting joy. They are not the underlying wellspring of joy that God intends for his people. See, the other error we can make is we can be so distracted with our problems, with our pains and our afflictions, and has, as all of us can attest to, no matter who we are in this room, that at some point, in many, in many cases, many, many points, even seasons, there are periods and flashpoints of pain and loss and sadness in our lives. 
If we don't have that wellspring to draw from, then it doesn't take long for the weight of all the sadness, the brokenness, and the discouragement of life to crush us and convince us that there is no joy. So you see, placing our faith in something other than that wellspring of joy that Jesus is, is going to lead us to a place of deep sadness. I don't know if you've ever uh, heard or read the poem. Disney even made a little cartoon of it at one point called Casey at the Bad. Does, anybody ring, does that ring a bell for anyone? It tells a story of... Uh, in the first part of the 20th century, a baseball game between two teams. And, and uh, this one team, the underdog, is losing, and, and they think that they're done for. And then, surprise, surprise, they get three runners on base. People who probably normally wouldn't be able to do it got on base. And their team, which is about four points behind, needs something miraculous to happen. And that miracle seemed to be in the fact that those guys got on base. And so... Casey at the bat tells the story of how in that moment their great hero, Casey, comes to bat. And in Casey, he's a, he's a formidable, formidable baseball player. He's standing and, and he's going to knock it out of the park and, they, and the crowds know it and they're so excited and they're, they're just frenzied with the victory that is surely theirs. And Casey lets a ball... Passover. I would read the whole poem to you, but we don't have that kind of time. But he lets the ball go by. It's a strike. Because it was in the strike zone, but he didn't swing at it. He was waiting for that third strike. He lets another one come through, that second one, second strike. And the mob goes crazy. But now everything is down to that point. Now he's really going to get it. He's really going to knock that ball out of the park and drive everyone home. And they're going to win that game. And the pitch is thrown. There's dust and confusion. The poem doesn't actually say at that point what happened. It concludes with this refrain. I'm going to read that to you. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. I was thinking about that line when I was thinking about talking about, about joy. What I kept thinking about was that last line. And I hadn't read that poem in years and years and years. But for some reason, I kept thinking about there is no joy in Mudville. You know, Mudville is life. Mudville is our world. Mudville is the brokenness and the dreariness of of striving day after day after day, placing our hope in, in something that will get us through and maybe bring a smile. That's Mudville. And we live in Mudville. And there is no joy in Mudville. Why? Because we, until we come to Christ, do what the people we're going to read about did. And that is place our faith, place our hope, place our confidence in things that cannot deliver. Before I read the scripture we're going to read from today, Luke chapter 1, I'd like for us to pray one more time and ask God to open our mind as we open his word, to open our hearts as he opens our ears so that we hear and perceive his truth. And we will find that, that that vein of gold in the rock we're digging today is this, that Jesus is our joy. Pray with me. Father, we just bless your name. We thank you, Lord, that we can open your word together and celebrate the birth and the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, Father. Because you do all things well. You completed that job. You did that, what, what we needed, Lord. You did completely. You did thoroughly. You did perfectly. And because you did, we have joy. We have a victory. We have something knocked out of the park, Lord, that we could not hit out, Lord, on our own. We could not get rid of our sin. We could not 
purge our uncleanness, Father. We could not cure ourselves of our rebellion against you, Lord, but Jesus, Father, did. He came and he was sinless and he died as a sinless sacrifice for us. And because he did that, Father, we who are great sinners, I who am a great sinner, Father, am forgiven. And Lord, as we have turned to you and turned from our own way, Lord, and turned from those things where we have placed our faith, placed our hope, Lord, finding that they can't deliver, they can't give us a lasting joy. As we've turned from those things and turned to you, Lord, suddenly, suddenly the light comes. The day is upon us, Lord. We have Jesus. We have forgiveness. We have, Lord, hope that Satan can't take. We have a victory that cancer can't kill. We have, Lord, life. That lasts forever with you. So we bless your name. We bless you, Lord. Because you are the source of our joy. And so we pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 1, I want to read, it's a few verses here, and uh, there, there's more to the story, but because of time, I'll try to move quickly, and, and I invite you to spend some time looking at that passage. But it's a, it is a Christmas story in the sense that it goes or coincides with Jesus' announcement, his arrival, and, and uh, his, his coming to earth, and so forth, and what his mission ultimately was about. In Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and following, it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by law to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. In verse 10, And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him, in the, before the Lord, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just." to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And then Zechariah said to the angel, verse 18, How shall I know this, for I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years? And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Verse 21, And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they re realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And verse 24, After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has gone for me, done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people." You read further, you'll see, you'll read about his birth and how God made good on the promise he declared to Gabriel. Now, the interesting thing for me is that as I was thinking about joy, I, my mind was going to this scripture and I thought, well, that's not really necessarily the place I would have gone to to talk about joy today. And yet, my mind kept going here. And one of the reasons that it did was the fact that in addition to the fact that John's father, Zechariah, as he was hearing this announcement that God had answered 
his prayer. Now, you recall that their situation is very similar to some other peoples in the, in the Bible, right? That they were older, they had not had children. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Abraham and Sarah, doesn't it? So it's significant. It's huge. It's huge. And as he's hearing this noise, this, uh, not noise, this uh, proclamation from Gabriel, who has come from the presence of God to deliver to him this wonderful announcement, as his response should have been, and it's interesting to me that his response was not this, but his response should have been joy, he's consumed with his doubt. Now, I've thought about that a lot. And now, I was thinking about all this happening. And here he is, talking to the angel, hearing from the angel, and what's going on outside? There are crowds of people who are doing what? What are they doing? They're praying. How long have they been doing this? They've been doing it for hundreds of years. Praying and 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 praying. And together, feeling forgotten by God. This is, the, this is God's people. These are his people with whom God has made covenant to bless the nations of the earth through, to never leave them, to always uphold them, to be their God in, in spite of the rebellion. And they've been praying and they've not heard, at least to their collective knowledge, They've not heard from God, and they've been praying. And so what happens often when we pray and we persist and we we hang in there and time goes on and time goes on and time goes on and we feel or perceive that our prayers have not been heard, but that we become discouraged and defeated even in our prayers. Even though we do the work of the prayer, we sometimes come to a place that we believe God is not going to answer it. All those people outside, no idea of the joyful happening, that thing that God was doing in their midst. John, was his arrival was a, was a personal joy for Zechariah, wasn't it? For Elizabeth, too. But his coming was a big picture situation because not only was God blessing them, but God is blessing the people's Because John's purpose is to prepare the way for whom? Jesus. So there's something even bigger than they can imagine going on inside the temple while they're outside praying. And I was thinking about how easy it is for us to miss that joy that God has promised us. Do you know that the God who was moving here outside of the senses of the people gathered outside, outside of their hearing, outside of their seeing, that God who was moving there powerfully, dramatically, amazingly, is the same God who works today, changing hearts, changing destinies, breaking down strongholds, setting people free from the bondage of their sin and giving them a new destiny, one that once was hell is now bound for heaven, God's doing great things. And it's easy for us to miss what he's doing because we become accustomed to failure, to defeat. I think we, like they, sometimes become distracted by worry. We're distracted. Our attention is focused on some unsolved problem or something that hasn't yet happened, something we fear may be coming down the pike for us. We become distracted by worry. And we can, like they, become disappointed to the fact that disappointment is our norm. Does that make sense? That disappointment, we become used to disappointment. Can you think of a time or a season in your life where just, well, sure, why not? Another problem. Have you ever known anyone 
and maybe you are a person who has done this, that when God brings good things into your life, you're just waiting for the bad thing to fall. Well, God's people were in that position. They were distracted by worry. They had come to a place that disappointment was a norm. They were distrustful of God's promises. They wouldn't go out and say that God would lie to them, but they just weren't convinced that God's promises were for them anymore. Partly because they felt that maybe they had gotten outside of his reach. They had so many times broken their end of the covenant, failed him, turned away from him, followed their own paths, followed their own devices, and found themselves harvesting the fruits of that rebellion, judgment. The chains and shackles of the, of the enemy people around them, literally upon them. And come to a place that they didn't any longer feel that God's promises were for them. I think we struggle sometimes with this. I think today these are struggles for us. I think we can become distracted by worry. I think we can get so used to disappointment that it, that it is our norm. I think sometimes we are, and maybe not sometimes, maybe a lot of the time, distrustful of God's promises. Not that we would say God is a liar. We would say, well, I failed so many times. Surely God isn't going to forgive me now. Forgetting his promises. Forgetting that if any would confess, verse John 1, 9, confess their sin. That he would forgive and cleanse them and make them new. I think sometimes we also, like the people of Zechariah's day, become dismayed also by this one thing. If God does show up, well, I have to change. You know, we can get used to sadness. We can get used to failure. We can get used to pain and loss to the point that even as God works in our lives to deliver us from those things, we're not always sure we're willing to let them go. Because why? That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But we cling to them. We hold on to them because they're familiar to us. That sounds crazy, but we do it. We'll cling to our brokenness because we're afraid of where the healing of God may bring us. Because it does take us places. It takes us out of what is comfortable. God's working in your life. He's going to bring you to things that are uncomfortable. To grow you and to bless you. Why are they uncomfortable? Because they're not known to you. They're unfamiliar to you. But think of this. You're asking God to work in your life, and you're asking God to work in your situation. You're work, asking God to work in your family. Be ready for him to answer it. And as he answers it, be ready for him to place you or lead you into uncomfortable situations. Maybe, maybe you'll find an opportunity to share Christ, and you feel riddled with doubt. What do I have to say? What do I have to offer? But see, God is working in you, overcoming your brokenness in order to bring wholeness, not just to you, but through you to the lives of others. And the idea of God using you in that way can be overwhelming. But it's good. It's good. And it's not like God is kicking you out the door so you have to stand on stage by yourself, although you think that that's what Pastor Tom sometimes asks you to do. I'm not asking you to do that necessarily. But I don't want to speak in front of people. That's okay. Sometimes we're afraid of what God will call us to or lead us to because we're afraid that I have to do it on my own. Does God call you to do anything that you have to do on your own? I'm asking you. Does he ever call you to do anything that you have to do on your own? No way. He supports you. He upholds you. You know, the people of Zechariah's day the Jews of his day. They knew that there was much in their lives that had separated them from God. They knew about the idolatry. They knew about their faithlessness. They knew it was part of their 
psyche, if you will, collectively. But they had forgotten his promise in Psalm 30, verse 5. His anger is for a moment. Yes, God's going to deal with their sin, and he's going to judge it, but his anger, which is for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night. Hear this verse. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. What does God intend for you and for me in our walk with him? Does he intend for us to be so overcome by the fact that we're miserable sinners that we just dare never look to his throne? That we dare not trust that he could love us? Does God want us to be so overwhelmed with the weight of our horrible sin that we can't believe that God would love us? That we deserve all the pain that we're suffering, well, which is actually, in fact, true, but that, that's not what God intends for you. What does God intend? But for you and for me to walk in the joy of a life that's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We're not who we once were. If you're a Christian, you, you are not who you once were. And you're no longer just a citizen of Mudville. You're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You belong to him. That is your destiny. That is who goes with you when you go out into the world. This king of the universe goes with you. And there's joy in that. He doesn't handle you. He doesn't handle me as we deserve. He handles us with gentleness and compassion and mercy, inviting us to trust him, inviting us to believe that he intends better for us than what we would settle for in the world. It's his purpose that when we see the lights and the decorations, that, that these things that we might get so distracted by, we forget the real point of them, but that these things be pointers to the whole point of Christmas, which is that Jesus Christ was born. And there's joy in that. Isaiah 55 Verses 10 through 12 says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. This is God's word. Verse 11. So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Do you hear the confidence of those words? Do you hear the power of those words? It's not maybe, I hope it will happen. This isn't God saying, well, if everything falls just right, then this will happen. This is God saying, as I have spoken, so shall it be. And as God has spoken about your life, as God has spoken about your future, so shall it be. And there is joy in that. Verse 12, for you shall go out in joy. That's his purpose for you. That we remember who we are. Who are we but the children of God? Who are we but people who deserved hell but were given heaven? People who did not deserve his love but given an abundance of lavished love cherished by our God and Father. You shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. You know, all creation rejoices at the miracle of your life as redeemed by God. There's joy in creation in the joy that we have in Jesus. There's a third century man... Um, he was anticipating death. He wrote these words and translated it. They come to this. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I've discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy, which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. Uh, they are despised. They are persecuted but they care not. They're masters of their souls. They've overcome the world. These people 
are the Christians, and I am one of them. Do you know the secret? Do you know who the secret is? It's Jesus. Jesus is the secret. He's the reason for the season. He's the secret of the season. He's the point of it. He's our conqueror. He's our savior. Isaiah 52, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. Listen, your watchmen fill up their, lift up their voices and together they shout for joy. That good news of Jesus. That's what we're proclaiming. We're not a defeated people. We're not a conquered people by the world or by our own passions, our own sinfulness. We're not conquered by those things. We're victorious because of Jesus. Do you know that Jesus, in coming for you, has declared that God, who knows you so well, loves you in spite of yourself and has raised you up so that you might know his love. And that love is a forever love. Don't miss the joy. Don't miss it. Jesus is our joy. Would you stand, please? I invite you to join me in prayer. And I invite you to, where you and I are often struggling to find joy, to experience this joy, to remember the joy, especially in seasons of sadness, in seasons of pain. I invite you to remember your joy and to come back to him, to be renewed in him. We all need that renewing. We all sometimes get distracted or dismayed. We all get confused by the messages of the world. Our pain lies to us. And it tells us we're God. That were conquered. The word of God says we're not. That we're remembered and cherished. Be renewed in your joy. Don't miss it. Just pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you that as you have called us here today, Lord, that we have the opportunity to be renewed in your word. Without your word, Lord, we would be lost. We would be adrift, Lord, in this crazy world around us. We wouldn't have any light, Lord, to, to navigate the darkness that surrounds us. And yet, Father, in your mercy, you have given us the light of your word. And through it shines the light of Jesus into our hearts, our wretched, dark hearts, where that light has come and made us new. And we praise you, Lord God, that you have loved us that way. And that your love isn't fickle like ours, Lord. It doesn't just end and flow, Or One day you love us, the next day you don't, Lord. It is rock steady. And it never changes. And the time, the, the years as they pass, Lord, even the century, Lord, it cannot change the fact. It cannot erode the fact, Lord, of that love. And so, Lord, as we have trusted you, we're in safe hands. As we've trusted in you, Lord, you have given us life. You have made us new. And nothing can take that away. We have a reason to smile. We have a reason to sing. We have a reason to clap our hands and shout for joy. Not just today and in this moment, but when we leave here, when we go into work, when we go home, when we go, Lord, into the things that this week hold for us. Lord, we have a joy the world cannot take away. Because Jesus, Lord, lives. We love you. I pray, Lord, that you will bless you tomorrow. Help us, Lord. Help each one to turn fully to you and allow us joy to renew them, to rekindle the fire of your love in their lives. And for anyone who doesn't yet know personally the joy, has not yet personally responded, has not yet personally received that forgiveness, that newness, that life that you promised them, let today be the day. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was born, Lord.
And in particular, I, I was thinking how that song reminds us of that special time when we, when we spend it with him in prayer, reading his word, and we have quiet time, and you know what I mean. Those moments where we hear from him. Remember this, the Lord loves you, and he knows your heart, and he cares for you. He cares about your pain. He cares about what makes you sad. He cares about those problems. Um, in his wisdom, he'll navigate you through those things and bring you to what's on the other side. Remember that. And when you're discouraged, remember the joy that you have in Jesus. Don't miss it. Don't miss that joy. Sometimes there is an act of will on our part, but where we have to say, Lord, I'm feeling, I'm feeling my emotions, whatever it is, I'm feeling the pain, I'm feeling the heartache. But I choose to remember who you are and your promises to me. I choose your joy. So in that, re in that regard, remember to choose the joy. Remember his promises for you and that he is with you. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. And he made this as you trust in this word, let this joy renew your courage and be your strength. Nehemiah tells us that the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's true. Let him renew your strength as you remember the joy you have in Jesus Christ. You have a victory. You have someone who loves you and is with you no matter what all the time. We have someone who 